So, a creepy little story to get your weekend off to a fine start this evening. Think back to your youth. Was there ever a time when you disobeyed your parents, and you ended up getting into a little bit more trouble than you anticipated? I'm sure we can all think of at least one occasion when that happened. So, the moral of tonight's story may be, always listen to your parents, they do know best sometimes, you know. Okay. Without further ado, here we go. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear friends, because it's time to listen. Fuck you! Nathan Keene screamed at his grandmother. Her quivering lips stiffened and sucked in her gasp. The widening sclera of her aged vision looked as though they'd pop out of her skull. With all the strength his little hands could summon, Nathan slammed the door behind him. He could hear Nana calling his name as Gramps returned to his study with mumbled curses. The seething ten-year-old cut through the neighbor's backyard. He stomped over their vegetable garden and hopped over the small chain-link fence to the street. One of the diamond-shaped wires slipped across his palm and opened a bleeding slit. The sting that followed was fierce, but otherwise ignored by his screaming thoughts. He made his way past Oak Road and crossed the street with his eyes to the asphalt. Gramps' words rattled inside of him, acting as crazy as his father. An orange Camry deafened him with its blaring horn, followed by an angry woman shouting, Use both eyes, punk! Nathan raised a miniature yet powerful middle finger to the driver's bumper. Screw everyone, he thought. Screw everyone in the world. This is where his mother left him with his grandparents, shoved in Leon County's fat rolls, Tallahassee. Nana said she needed a mommy break from it all. <laughs> of course, after all the shouting, all the sleepless nights, she needed a mommy break. So, here he was, pawned off like the forgotten luggage from an airport's baggage carousel. She was out there enjoying the vintage of life. She was out there soaking in the laughing sun. She was out there Happier without him. Happier without Dad. Bitter tears poured within the purple ring that encircled his bruised eye. A memento he received last week. The shiner was given to him by Marcus Myhall, an eighth grader in his neighborhood with the athletic build and looks of Popeye's Bluto. Marcus spent his afternoons waiting for the school bus to round the corner alongside a misfit posse of skinny jeans and sagging asses. Once that yellow hinged door folded open, he was a lion, deciding which prey had the weakest windpipe. It made him feel alive, as though the bus were an enormous capsule filled with a limitless antidepressant. But on the day he mistook Nathan Keene for a wounded gazelle, the dosage fought back. Sidewalks led Nathan to the gated entrance to Hollow Park, a mature chunk of caustic land amidst many homes in the community. Beneath its underlain layer of soft rock were subterranean drainage systems that formed caves. The landscape was pockmarked with sinkholes dry and wet, shallow and deep. His shoes scuffed the grit that permeated the sloping path. He felt happier here, hidden beneath the groves that kept the May heat from beating on him. Time felt elusive, and life felt fair. Nobody could hurt him here. He crossed the small bridge Dad once tripped over and peered into the soft stream. This was, once, their park. Every other spring, they'd always come back here while visiting his grandparents. The memories felt pleasant at first, but soon started to sting again. Those were the nights when he could sleep, before the dreams became clots of empty spaces. 
Every night, accelerating and expanding into a gash of dark energy like a galaxy without stars. No oxygen. No solid ground to tread. Only the titanic darkness. Hungry darkness that fed on his house, his room, his father. Until everything inevitably disappeared. Yes, the park was where he'd disappear as well. Temporarily, of course. It wouldn't be difficult for everyone to guess where he'd run off to. Soon enough, they'd all come running. Sorry for what they'd put him through. Gramps would apologize for being an asshole. Nana would make her ambrosia pudding. Mom would see that her son wasn't baggage. Dad would come back home. <laughs> His plan was flawless. Just to the right of him, near the restrooms, the pathway he was on led guests to the park's main loop, the sinkhole trail. Any visitor could look straight down the throat-like chutes and see an array of colored pools. You could watch rushing water disappear and then pop up again in a river rise. Wooden posts announced your arrival at each sink, as well as its given name. The surrounding trees were marked with green blazes that guided hikers to each site. Nathan scratched his head and pondered. Hmm, where could he wait it out? The painted blazes would lead him down a flight of stairs towards shriveled sink. Just beyond there, the trail rose up to an overlook of Spinner Sink. He could then slide down the path and circle left to Virtue Springs. Then an idea struck him like a freight train. With the luscious green organs of Hollow Park was a body of water separated from the collective path. A gaping sinkhole called the Dismal Moor. Hidden beneath its dirty black water is a pit that plummets deep into the earth. Deep, lightless catacombs branch out for miles, and also connect to Virtue Springs. There was his answer. The pay dirt he needed. He knew exactly where to find it, too. On occasions when his mother didn't join them, he and his father wandered off the trail to see the sinkhole for themselves. They weren't overly impressed by the wide drink of water, but his father enjoyed humoring the title. Mom disagreed with him. Nathan recalled all the times Nana warned him to steer clear of the dismal moor. The path leads you away from that sinkhole because it isn't safe. Children, especially you, should never play near there. The soil is very loose and may collapse beneath your feet. It is not a good place for kids to be. This was the only way he could make his mother understand. Really understand. He wanted the weight of his world to compress her shoulders. He wanted the hot glowing embers that burnt his heart to singe hers. He wanted her to watch the swelling crevasse of empty space to gouge her dreams every night. Nathan brushed away an escaping tear with his knuckles. He discreetly followed the green blazes to the set of steps. They lowered into a depression with a wooden post that read in large, white letters, Shriveled Sink. He crossed the observation deck that provided a clear vertical view down a slender chimney of sloshing brown water. He idly wondered if tossing in a coin would earn him a wish. The trail climbed out of the crater and began its curvature towards Spinner Sink. His brown eyes traced along the sides until he found the cutaway that his father had discovered. He paced his sneakers over the brushes of wire grass that tickled his legs. Ahead of him was the oval rock they both pissed on once. Not too much farther past that were the magnolia trees that resembled his teacher's hairdo. (laughs) Before long, He arrived. The sinkhole stretched 40 meters with a cascade of plants growing along its bowl-shaped walls. A bent cypress tree loomed over the edge he stood on. Its branches curled like puppet fingers over the black water. Dead leaves voyaged across the surface. 
Nathan wrapped his fingers around the brown, grey bark and slid cautiously down the shallow slope. Dirt caked into his rubber soles and smeared over the white laces. A few rocks were dislodged and sent bouncing into the pond, falling forever beneath the dark. He stopped himself just a few inches from the more stilled blackness and sat into the soil. Crazy, Gramps had shouted, acting as crazy as his father. The thoughts bounced, bent, and shattered, as though his brain were a small blender. Then he could just unplug it for a while. <laughs> that would be nice. Almost too nice. He clasped a handful of wet pebbles encrusted with dirt and skidded them across the water. White ripples pulsed over one another in seams. Who are you? A voice asked, abruptly. Nathan sprung up and nearly slipped feet first into the sinkhole. The question wasn't demandingly spit out by an adult. It was calm and spoken with childlike curiosity. His brown eyes combed the pit's soil-lined walls to the surrounding rim. Was he followed here? No. Nobody was there. Until he looked down. A face stared up at him, bobbing out of the black water. Nathan froze. It looked like a boy's face. His skin was moon white with grime caked around the chin and ear tips. Strands of his short blonde hair swayed and danced beneath the surface. The water was too shady to spy any white neck or flowing clothes below him. He looked like a pale island with closed lips carved in the dry land. The face then blinked and slid its blue bell eyes to their corners, facing him. Are you crying? Nathan wiped his eyes and picked up his nerves into an unmoved bravado. <laughs> no, he scoffed. You aren't supposed to swim in there. The boy's soaked eyebrows perked. But I swim here all the time. It isn't so bad to me. His eyelids wilted like partially closed curtains, as though we were about to suck in a heavy yawn. Why are your cheeks red and your eyes puffy? One of them's black, too. Nathan grinded his teeth and now felt self-conscious. This kid had some nerve showing up uninvited and now examining him. Was he on trial or something? I wasn't crying. What do you care? I do care. Why? We've never met before. Nathan's stare became slits. Good point. I'm James. The face winded its lips into a misshapen smile. Waiting for someone? Nathan scowled inwardly. The boy named James was strange, weird-looking and very nosy. Yet behind that oddball persona was a pleasant voice, which baffled him the most. My mum left me here. I don't know for how long, <laughs> maybe forever. The thoughts carried air pockets through him that threatened to rupture with anger. Oh. James's inquisitive look melted. My parents left me here too. A new weight carried his voice. Curiosity veered Nathan back to those blue eyes. Why? He asked. They went away without me. I thought we were happy. But things always change. James heaved a gloomy breath. The world ends with change, doesn't it? In that instance... Nathan didn't feel alone, in the most ironic of all places. His inner wrath simmered to a mild boil. Yes, the oddball was right. Change meant the finale of everything. Adults did it all the time, because they can't hear it. The cries tugging at their pants from the floor. All that matters is them, and only them. He couldn't peg a word for what he was feeling, but an adult would have called it empathy. I'm Nathan. 
James's sinking expression was reanimated. It's a pleasure to meet you, Nathan. Parents treat us all the same, don't they? Nathan nodded. Then we Lost Boys should stick together, right? Nathan nodded. Pallid hand rose to the surface with wrinkled fingertips that presented themselves. What do you say we shake on it? He offered. Nathan leaned over the pond and extended his arm to reach. The hand snapped forward and seized him. James's smile withered. Thick pain whirled from his wrist and twisted like an Indian bird. The grip plunged his hand into the black water. A paralyzing chill kissed his cut palm, as though his veins were becoming icicles. In his mind he yelled, Let me go! But his voice box shriveled. His free hand snatched wildly in the air for anything solid enough to cling to. Freezing pain was prodding his submerged arm and climbing higher. <sighs> This had to be a prank, a sick prank that a weird boy played on all strangers. His roaming fingers caught something coarse and flaky, <gasps> the drooping tree. He bent and dug his nails into the bark. With a good yank, he managed to wrench his arm out of the murk. Then he saw what had hold of him and felt his mind derail. What followed out was a cluster of branch-like tentacles noosed around his arm. They resembled vines that were dripping and dead. The rotten smell from their smooth, gluey membranes induced vomit. Mental paralysis set in. His sanity untethered and drifted to freedom somewhere far away from this. The face that jutted from the abyssal water was no longer James. Its milky skin sank to bluish green with prominent flabby bruises. Both bluebell irises were engulfed by pupils that were dilating like spilled ink. What's the matter, Nathan? It crooned from receding lips and deformed teeth. I thought you were a lost boy. No. It wasn't a voice at all, just sputters and gurgles from water-logged lungs. Nathan's fingers slipped from the calloused grooves. The raw tentacles dragged him towards the watery fissure. His sneakers dug into the earth to cement himself from the sticky knot's unrelenting pull. The black jelly that had once been his eyes drained into their sockets. The bruised bags of flesh slumped and split apart, releasing putrid bile. Green ichor infused with the black water and floated atop its surface like oil streaks. The weak skin further dissolved into greenish foam that reached the sinkhole's rims. Its ears, nose, cheeks and lips all became liquefied mass to feed the cesspool. But the voice did not melt away. It rang like a siren from the discolored skull's splintered fibers. Come inside. The loneliness is over and never coming back. I'm calling for you. We're all calling for you. Nathan. 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 A pain was being ignited in Nathan's shoulder. With every violent jerk and tug, the internal fire outspread. It couldn't be contained. Bone started to talk. His threshold of pain erupted from a churning pop from the socket. He hoisted his neck and bawled mindlessly to the treetop. The world became fuzzy red grains. His mind short-circuited. In a gasping, broken voice, he cried for help. He cried for his mother and father. He cried for his grandparents. 
somewhere within the collapsing halls of his consciousness. A speck of solidity knew that he was yelling, but couldn't hear anything. It was being drowned out by an amalgam of screams. Child screams. They wafted from the dismal moor in a choir of mindless pleas and indiscernible moans. Come inside. Meet the family. We're all lost boys and girls here. It hurts to fight, doesn't it? Just let go. Why fight it? It jerked him ever closer to the dark green throth. Every sense of feeling left his dislocated shoulder in a numb veil. Howls of wailing children invaded his eardrums. He could gaze straight down into the moor's gullet now. No reflection stepped back. Only empty space. Yes, the infinite empty space that waited for him. The darkness was coming closer. Hungry darkness. Horrific reality pitted his fleeting world. He was all alone. Isolated from everyone. His parents' silhouettes waned on the horizon. <gasps> You're slipping. I can feel it. The pain will stop, I promise. Aren't you tired of them hurting you? Leave your parents behind. Just like they did you. Nathan's strength abandoned him. His body glided over the rim and dropped head first into the tainted fluid. Sharp chills stabbed every nerve they could reach. The water shot into his ears and nostrils. Invisible rip currents sucked him further into the void. His lungs contracted and felt like they were tearing open. Screams bubbled out of his throat. Wake up, he begged. Wake me up, please, please. The tide drew him lower into the moor's suffocating trenches. Deeper he sank from the oval-shaped twilight that shrank above him. Inevitably, Everything disappeared for Nathan Keen, until all that remained was the bottom that he would never reach. The countdown commenced in Hollow Park. A group of kids, ranging from ten to twelve, scattered. Cindy frantically separated from the bulk of them. Their hysterical giggles and hushes would surely get her caught. The grey sky looked like bundles of fine lint. She formed a mental map of all the dead giveaway spots. Be it seeking or hiding, she was the best. But this time Jeremy Briar was it, and Jeremy Briar is a cheater. Of course, he thought the opposite was true. Every cheater always did. Mum told her so. Squinty eyes is peeking while she counts. He whined every time it was her turn to find everyone. That was his favourite nickname for her. It used to make her cry, but has since diluted into a faint annoyance. A close second was the obnoxious reminder of what his father called her mom, Mrs. Nip. She hated every atom that boy was made of. But this time would be different. She'd wipe the floor with him. She crossed an old jeep road and circled right around three deep, dark throats of Savile Sink. The water used to look clear and blue, before groundwater, contaminated by nitrate, seeped its way through Tallahassee's loins over the years. Thirty, her instincts warned. Definitely reached thirty by now. Out of time. She leapt over a family of wildflowers and abandoned the trail. There was no doubt he'd try and seek her out first. The first one caught was branded the worst hider of the bunch. That was the glowing red iron Jeremy Briar reserved with her name on it. Cheetahs are the scum of the earth. None deserved even a thread of sympathy in this world. That was why her father left for Ozaka when she was three. 
Mum told us so. She stopped. There were bands of bright yellow in between the trees that tangled around their trunks. Police line, do not cross, was scribed in pitch capital letters. Caution tape, she'd seen it before, mostly downtown for strayed voltage warnings. Hmm, why Hollow Park, though? Curiosity overwhelmed her as she maneuvered past the barricade. The earth in front of her dipped into a round crevice. A pool that resembled tar gathered at the bottom. It was a sinkhole, but not just any run-of-the-mill sink for tourists to gawk at. No, this was the Dismal Moor. She and the others used to play here a lot, before the accident two years ago. The body of a ten-year-old was discovered by a hiker named Barry Moss, who'd heard the toddler's scream. By the time he arrived, the boy had reportedly fallen in and drowned. Ever since then, parents and authorities have cracked down even harder with Hollow Park safety. Mum didn't have to know, though. Everyone else would be too chicken. Especially the cheetah, Briar. How could she throw away this trump card? She mindfully slid down the incline towards the dark water. Cindy knew all the stories that swashed around the moor's lips. Lauren Hudson said it was caused by a meteorite, and that their city was built around it. Billy Bracken says a witch's house once stood here, before she cast the wrong spell and caused the earth to swallow her. The fattest grape on the vine was that the sinkhole is haunted, riddled with human bones inside its limestone cavity. Remains from an old graveyard that was built over the train, before sinking into the earth and being swallowed whole, souls and all. The pit plunged so deep into the lightless shaft that no ghost could ever swim out of it. But Cindy knew they were all just flim-flam stories. She waited in the dirt and traced white creases in the stilled water. Are you hiding? Someone asked. Cindy panicked, expecting to find someone to leech her for the spot. Her monolid eyes met a small face that plopped out of the black. It was a boy that looked like a glistening sheet of white. Droplets of water sailed down his black brows and pasty cheeks to rejoin their kin. She'd never seen him in the park before. Are you hiding? Yes, I'm hiding. Are you going to rat on me? She groused at him. What do you mean? The boy looked confused, as though an invisible hand scratched his drowning hair. Shh. Cindy blew a finger against her lips. Haven't you ever heard of hide and seek before? I'm hiding. Someone else is looking. Get it? His puzzled stare lit up. Oh, I love that game. Can I play too? Cindy crossed her arms. As long as you don't cost me this spot, I don't care. But you have to be quiet. I can do that. Good, she smiled. Her voice dimmed in a whisper. My name's Cindy. What's yours? She watched the corners of his mouth turn up in an asymmetric smile. It's nice to meet you, he quietly trilled. His bluebell eyes broadened with excitement. A grim black and blue ring encasing one of them. I'm Nathan.
Well, quite a creepy one for you this evening. And a little bit different from ones I've been doing recently. Hope you enjoyed that one. If so, join me again really soon. Because I've got another story coming up just a couple of days from now. Until then, bye-bye. And have a nice weekend. <laughs>